Hello, hello to everyone and uh, uh, welcome for the first session of the Cultural Memory of, pa of Past Dictatorship series. I am Dr. Guido Bartolini from University College Cork and together with Dr. Diana Popa from Tallinn University, I am the curator of this series of events that aim to explore the cultural memory of dictatorships across the globe with a specific focus on questions of complicity and co-responsibility which we would like to raise by relying on Michael Rothbard's umbrella term, implicated subject. The series, which starts today, comprises three seminars, which will lead to a two-day online conference on 19, 20 May. The Cultural Memory of Past Dictatorship series was made possible thanks to our sponsors, which are the Irish Research Council, the National University of Ireland, the Center for Advanced Studies in Languages and Cultures of University College Cork, and the ERC project Translating Memories, the Eastern European Past in the Global Arena, founded by the European Research Council under the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Having said that, I'm extremely pleased to welcome today's speaker, who is Professor Michael Lazara. Professor Lazara is Professor of Latin American Literature and Cultural Studies in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of California, Davis, where he's also Professor of Human Rights Studies and where he serves as Associate Vice Provost for academic programs and partnerships in the Office of Global Affairs. Professor Lazara's research focuses on post-dictatorship and post-conflict culture in contemporary Latin America particularly on the ways in which individuals and societies construct memories of past political violence. His publications include the books Chile in Transition, The Poetics and Politics of Memory, 2006, Luz Arce and Pinochet's Chile, Testimony in the Aftermath of State Violence, 2011, and Civil Obedience, Complicity and Complacency in Chile since Pinochet, 2018. He's currently working on a project about narratives of children of perpetrators and accomplices in Chile, Argentina, and Peru. And he recently published with Charles Walker an English language version, uh, English version and edition of Peruvian writer Jose Carlos Aguero, Los Renditos, The Surrendered, Reflections by a Son of Shining Path. The title of his talk today is Disobedientes, Implicated Subjects, Memory and Responsibility in Post-Dictatorship Chilean Documentaries. Please, Professor Lazara, the, the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you so much, Guido, and uh, good morning, good afternoon. Good morning from California, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Um, wonderful to be with all of you today. So I wanted to begin by saying a very special thank you to uh, Dr. Bartolini and Dr. Pope for the very kind invitation to be part of this symposium on cultural memory of past dictatorships. Uh, really a, a topic that I've been involved with intellectually and personally uh, for, for a long time, for many years. Um, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to hear the other keynote speakers over the coming weeks. I think this is the first of the sessions and uh, also to joining for the full symposium on May 19th and 20th. I'm going to be sharing a bit today about narratives of implication, uh, picking up on the uh, topic of the conference from the Latin American perspective in particular. Uh, but of course, I'm very eager to learn from colleagues who are looking at this topic in many other contexts and parts of the world as well. I think the beauty of this conference is that it, it really does truly bring a global perspective. And as uh, Guido mentioned, the work I'll present today is new work uh, part of a larger project on narratives of children and relatives of collaborators and perpetrators in Chile, Argentina, and Peru. I'm really just getting started on this. Uh, Guido mentioned I also have an administrative role at UC Davis, which sometimes slows the projects down a little bit. Uh, but uh, my way of getting started on this project is through this initial reading of two Chilean documentaries uh, that I'll share about today. So I'm going to uh, get started here and share my screen. So let me do that quickly. Perfect. Uh, Guido, you can see the screen okay? Perfect. Yes. So I'd like to begin with, um, with an epigraph uh, that you can see here on this slide. It comes from an Argentine psychoanalyst named Mariana Wikinski. 
uh, and it reads, to become an ethical subject is in the end an ongoing task. So within Latin American memory debates, discussions of uh, what's been called post-memory uh, by Marianne Hirsch or intergenerational memory have focused almost exclusively to date on the memories of children of victims of state-sponsored violence. Thanks to interviews, testimonies, documentaries, and other forms of cultural production, we're now quite familiar with the stories of los hijos or los hijes, uh, the children of the disappeared, the children of militants who either praised their parents' militancy or in certain cases resented them for choosing politics over the family, uh, the stories of children born in exile or those who were uprooted from their homes at very young ages. We've also heard the harrowing stories of stolen children raised by their military captors and who only in recent years have discovered their true identities. In, in some cases, they have not. They have not. Um, and often this has come with mixed reactions and consequences. Since mid-2017, however, in a global climate in which the right had and has become emboldened, new voices are emerging that are now revealing other kinds of intergenerational memories, specifically memories of children or relatives of perpetrators of human rights violations and crimes against humanity. These voices are complex, wounded, insistent, and they speak in varied tones. In some cases, they predictably replicate, uh, to pick up on a term uh, coined by, by Steve Stern, uh, the historian, they, they sometimes replicate the salvationist memory scripts on which they were weaned by their military forebears. This is the case, for example, of a woman named Loreto Iturriaga Neumann, who in 2017 in Chile defended her military father on TV as a hero and savior of the nation arguing for his liberation from prison, where he was serving a sentence for human rights violations. In other cases, these, uh, these disobedient uh, children speak out courageously and admirably against their relatives, breaking longstanding pacts of silence and defending the right to truth, memory, and justice. The collective known as Historias Desobedientes y con Faltas de Ortografía, which translates to disobedient stories with spelling errors, which was born in Argentina, but now has chapters also in Chile and Brazil, provides a perfect example of such insurrectional voices. Still in other cases, the children seek, I would say, a middle ground, unable to break the sentimental bond with the parent completely, but also unable to approve of the parents' conduct. Heard in concert, these different voices are starting to unveil new zones of memory that until now have not been prominent in Latin America's memory sagas. In many instances, as Argentine critic Leonor Arfuch once observed, these voices emerge from a desire to quote, construct another identity a new identity that inexorably unravels inherited genetic markers and instead opens the subject toward the ethical dimensions of the self." End of the quote. So that leads me to my main question, which is what speaking positions, narratives, and frameworks for self-understanding do the children and family members of perpetrators and collaborators deploy? In what languages do they account for themselves to evoke Judith Butler's term as they struggle with the shame that stems from a painful inheritance fueled by a desire to face the past responsibly? Building on the tradition of Levinas and Foucault, Butler affirms that the self always exists in relation to a series of ethical norms or moral frameworks that determine it as a subject although sometimes those norms and frameworks can be in conflict with one another, she says. For that reason, according to Butler, the self that tries to account for itself does so unable to escape the conditions that determine its existence. Yet at the same time, it does so aware of the fact that to become a narrated subject, he or she will have to reflect on the conditions that made his or her existence possible in the first place and to take a stand with respect to those conditions. Butler goes on to point out something very important, I think, which is that 
opaque or unknowable zones of experience will always remain for the subject. In other words, the subject will never fully be able to account for every facet of its existence. Still, in Butler's con conceptualization, accounting for oneself also implies accountability. It is an ethical act and a willingness to become, as she says, undone in relation to another, that is to become vulnerable, for only vulnerability can lead to a personal or social transformation. So starting with these ideas, my goal today is to explore and compare preliminarily two recent Chilean films in which descendants of civilian collaborators with the Pinochet regime's apparatus of repression tackle their forebears' sordid pasts, each to somewhat different ends. The first film, Andres Lubert's El Color del Camaleón, The Color of the Chameleon from 2017, charts the director's discovery of his father's 1978 kidnapping by Pinochet's secret police, the physical and psychological torture to which his father was subjected, the training his father received to become an agent of state terror, his father's exile, and the traumas that plagued his father for decades after he lived this nightmare. The second film, Lisette Orozco's El Pacto de Adriana, Adriana's Pact from 2017, chronicles the director's discovery of her favorite aunt's complicity with the Pinochet regime. In both cases, we find young filmmakers who find themselves trapped between family loyalty and responsibility to tell the truth publicly. To adopt Michael Rothberg's term, the term that inspires this conference, both of these filmmakers might be called implicated subjects. Rothberg's idea of the implicated subject shifts our focus away from the accomplices or perpetrators themselves toward others who may not have been directly responsible for acts of human rights violations, but who are nevertheless implicated in these acts by virtue of their association with those who committed them. Rothberg tells us that trauma theory, broadly speaking, created somewhat binary understandings of violence in which the main actors were almost always cast as victims or perpetrators. Yet both of the films I'll analyze, like almost all scenarios of historical violence in general, and here's Rothberg's quote, do not permit clean distinctions between traumatized victims and traumatizing perpetrators. Rothberg writes that the category of the implicated subject emerges in relation to both historical and contemporary scenes of violence, that is, it describes the indirect responsibility of subjects situated at temporal or geographic distance from the production of social suffering. It helps to direct our attention to the conditions of possibility of violence, as well as to its lingering impact, and can suggest new routes for opposition. Like the proximate term complicity, but with more contextual, uh, conceptual flexibility, Implication draws our attention to how we are entwined with and enfolded into histories and situations that surpass our agency as individual subjects. So faced with the option of keeping silent or protecting the family myth or speaking out, implicated descendants of collaborators and perpetrators must make ethical choices about how to deal with or live with their implication. To what extent is the implicated subject willing to account for itself, to assume the costs of telling the truth, as Foucault might say? The two films I'll speak about now illustrate that the implicated subject can take different narrative approaches to implication and self-rendering as it attempts to emerge as an ethical subject. So I'll move on to the first of the films, uh, The Color of the Chameleon by Andres Lubert. And I'll start uh, this part out by referring to another documentary, not one of these two, by a very well-known Argentine documentarian, Andres Di Tela, uh, who really has been a pioneer uh, within, within documentary filmmaking in Latin America in recent decades. And uh, I'll start with Di Tela's film, La Televisión y Yo, Television and Me, from 2002. And in this film, Di Tela in his voiceover states that at a certain point in the process of making his film, he realized that instead of making a documentary about the history of television in Argentina, as the title indicates, he was really making a documentary about his relationship to his father. 
about the secrets that shape the relationship between a father and a son, and about whether or not it is possible to work through or confront those secrets. His documentary becomes, in his words, un pretexto para hablar, the pretext for a conversation between his father and him, which took years to achieve. And still, even after that conversation happens to some extent in the film, Ditela wonders what silences remain and if it is ever really possible for a family story to be anything other than a myth. Andres Lubert's The Color of the Chameleon channels this same dilemma. From the very beginning, the film is also a pretext for a conversation between Andres and his father, a man named Jorge Lubert, who at age 21 in 1978 was kidnapped, psychologically manipulated, tortured, and forced to collaborate with the CNI, which was uh, the Pinochet regime's uh, second secret police organization. Having completed a degree in technical drawing, Jorge Lubert went to work in the late 70s for the Chilean Telephone Company, an organization that became a fertile hunting ground for Pinochet's secret police, which hoped to recruit from the telephone company collaborators who had technical skills that could prove useful to the regime's repressive apparatus. Once he was captured, Jorge Lubert was taken to the apartment of one of his friend's brothers, a man named Jose Pavez, a particularly sinister figure within the secret police. There he was tortured with electric shock to the point of losing consciousness. After a harrowing five month ordeal that included intelligence training, extreme dehumanization and mental and physical preparation to carry out repression, Lubert escaped into exile to East Berlin and later to Louvain, Belgium where he underwent psychotherapy with noted psychotherapist Jorge Barudi. He married a Belgium, Belgian woman, had two sons, the younger of which was Andres, the filmmaker. And in the following years, and for reasons that are difficult to explain, but that seem to border on self-punishment, Jorge Lubert worked as a cameraman filming footage in dangerous war-torn areas of the world, such as Afghanistan, El Salvador, and Iraq. Silence, that is Andres Lubert's near total lack of understanding of his father's past provides the starting point for this film. He says, dad, I feel like until today, I never really had the opportunity to get to know you. We don't have a relationship that I would have liked to have had. I tried to speak about your past, about your silence, but I don't know what to do with it. What happened to you that haunts you to this day? Born in Belgium in 1985, Andres, the son and filmmaker, spent his whole childhood knowing very little about Chile and speaking French and German almost exclusively. At age 19, he began his journey to get to know his father and the, and the country that his father left behind. An early documentary that Andres made when he was only 19 called Mi Padre, Mi Historia, My Father, My Story from 2004, kind of a first attempt to get to know the father through film, charts the son's journey back to Chile to meet his father's parents and his sibling and their siblings, and to talk to others who might teach him something about Allende, the dictatorship, and the violence that people suffered during the Pinochet years. Interestingly, at no point in that film does Jorge Lubert's voice emerge, the father's voice. Um, nor does the film make it at all possible to say really what happened to the father. So haunted by his father's obstinate silence, over the next five years, Andres would go on to make two other films. One is called Search into Silence, Búsqueda en el Silencio from 2007, in which he probes the stories and experiences of other kids like him who grew up in Luvan as the children of Chilean exiles. And another experimental short that he made in 2009 called La Realidad, Reality, in which images from a film that his father made in the mid 1980s mix with images from Patricio Guzman's landmark film La Batalla de Chile, The Battle of Chile, as well as with Andres's own uh, prior films. So this, this film on reality is kind of a, a mixture of footage from these different sources. And as we watch that collage of images, we hear passages from a series of 1979 journals that Jorge Lubert, the father, wrote while in psychotherapy 
that described the torture and dehumanization process to which he was subjected. Passages from these documents are interrupted by the son's profound questioning of what constitutes reality and how to apprehend it. For his part, Jorge Lubert, the father, was also the author of several films, perhaps the most important of which was titled Dia 32, Day 32, which was a film made in 1982, an autobiographical fiction about a Latin American immigrant to Louvain who wanders around the city, drowns his sorrows in alcohol, and smokes incess incessantly in front of a snowy television set. The traumatized immigrant never speaks, but fuzzy images and the intercalation of recurring uh, images of soldiers and dead bodies speak to a mind that has been deeply and forever altered, militarily intervened, so to speak. So starting with silence, the film, The Color of the Chameleon might therefore be read as a chronicling of a process of coming into speech. Jorge Lubert's process, as well as the director's own process of trying to understand his personal story and establish dialogue with his father. This process, of course, is not at all easy. From a formal standpoint, the film is a collage of interviews, home movies, photographs, documents, clips from films that Andres or his father made, and diaries that together speak to the difficulty of recovering the father's story. The film, I would say, is full of failed Proustian moments in which Andres takes his father to significant memory sites in Chile, puts him in, in contexts, for example. Yet his father, at times, even when in these contexts, either refuses to talk or sets firm limits regarding how much he is willing to reveal. Why won't you speak? Andres asks. We came here so that you could tell me your story. If I weren't pressuring you to talk, this would be a silent film. So intelligently, the son acknowledges how difficult it is for his father to bear witness to his own trauma by displacing the father's voice in the film. Whenever the father's voice in the interviews, for example, reaches a limit regarding what he is willing to say, as occurs, for example, when he is speaking about being tortured while standing in front of Via Grimaldi's Peace Park, an actor's voice takes over, filling in the details from the father's therapy diaries. Only in this way can the son and the viewer compensate for certain silences that still permeate Jorge Lubert's speech. Throughout the film, Andres Lubert struggles with his father's position as a gray figure within Chile's, Chile's dictatorship saga. At one point, he expresses relief in knowing that although his father may have done terrible things, quote, he never killed anyone. At times, he's unsure as to whether he should interpret his father as a victim or a victimizer. To resolve this dilemma, and perhaps to bring himself a modicum of peace as an implicated subject, Andres turns to outside experts, what we might call memory professionals, who help him to gain perspective on his father's situation. In this sense, journalist Javier Rebolledo, uh, who's a very prominent journalist in Chile, uh, who's done some excellent work on complicity, uh, I, would, I would add. His, this journalist voice, which plays a major role in the later part of the film, I would say is determinant. Rebolledo reminds Andres that at the end of the day, his father was indeed a victim, and that because of that, quote, almost anything is forgivable. With this authoritative reading, Rebolledo's voice saturates the film in a way that sets up the son's closing reconciliatory gesture. In the final assessment, The Color of the Chameleon is an important, courageous, and moving film whose reconciliatory impetus speaks to the son's struggle and deep desire to gain some semblance of resolution to a painful secret that has shaped his life and subjectivity. Father and son in the last sequence admit that making the film has brought them closer. For Andres, it helped him to form, forge an identity on multiple levels. He says, I learned Spanish. I became a filmmaker. I became Chilean, he said. And then he goes on to say, I think I not only found a connection to my father, but to myself. 
Despite these positives, the viewer, however, wonders if the grays that make this case so thought-provoking are somehow smoothed over in the film by an implotment that culminates in concepts like redemption, reconciliation, and liberation. The son and the father are partially liberated from the past. The father has partially owned up to the grayness of his experience. The song, a song called Chameleon, echoed in the title of the film by Ricardo Gonzalez Candia that closes the film, suggests that a chapter has ended and that the chameleon, the father, having acknowledged his colors, is now an honorable man. The lyric says, el honor existe dentro tuyo, honor exists within you. The expert, Rebollevo, has also declared Lubert a victim. In the face of these gestures toward liberation and reconciliation, the viewer perhaps wonders if the son's desire to make a definitive statement that brings peace or momentary closure to a long and emotionally wrenching search is logical. Is it easier in the end for the implicated subject to eclipse the grays and render a verdict of victimhood that ultimately permits him a greater level of psychological equilibrium vis-a-vis -vis the father's secrets? So I'll move now to the second film, Adriana's Pact by Lisette Orozco, also from 2017, the same year. All families have secrets and mine is no exception. Adriana's Pact begins with this line, this voiceover by the director, Lisette Orozco, which plunges us once again into the quicksand of family secrets. In this case, the secret has to do with the role that Lisette's favorite aunt, Adriana Rivas, a woman who she calls Tia Chani, or Aunt Chani, was a civilian DINA agent, played in the 1976 kidnapping, torture, and disappearance of seven Communist Party and Mir militants from the Simon Bolivar 8800 detention center located in Santiago, Chile. A fugitive for more than 30 years, Adriana Rivas, the aunt, worked for decades as a nanny in Australia, only traveling occasionally and secretly to see family back in Chile. On one of those visits in 2007, the Chilean investigative police apprehended her on her arrival at Santiago's International Airport. It was in that moment that Lisette discovered that her favorite aunt, her idol, as she calls her in the film, had a dark past and that her family, largely Pinochetista, Pinochet supporting, had been covering up and denying that reality for years. Adriana's Pact is plotted as a psychological thriller that charts the director's evolution from a state of naivete with respect to her aunt's past, as well as that of her country, toward a critical moment in which she decides that betraying the family secret and her aunt is in fact her ethical duty, even if there is a heavy price to be paid for that betrayal. And indeed, there were important tolls to be paid, cutting ties with her aunt, suffering the scorn of many members of her extended family, and even receiving, as she told me, death threats from the military. In the end, however, Orozco defends the truth. And since finishing the film, faithful to her convictions, she's advocated publicly for her aunt's extradition from Australia to stand trial for her crimes. As in Lubert's case, private family secrets become the pretext for connecting to a previously ignored public history. Though it is certainly difficult to say in Orozco's case, if she was really as uninformed as she claims to be to the realities of the Pinochet regime, or if her on-screen naivete should be read instead as a convenient starting point for the development of her character, which sharpens the plotting of the story that she wants to tell in the film. Certainly her family's typical salvationist narrative of its invective against the left sharp, uh, shaped her perceptions of the dictatorship as a young girl. Her challenge now as a young woman is to work beyond this familial socialization. As evidence of this challenge, I would cite an important sequence from the beginning of the film in which Lisette's mother figure, trying to exonerate herself for keeping silent for so long, assures Lisette that her aunt is really an anomalous figure within the family who strayed away from the, core's family, uh, the family's core values. The mother says to Lisette, the problem is that we were six siblings and we all have the same values. 
and you share those same values. So I can't judge her, my sister, because she never did anything to me. Quite the opposite. I've never seen her harm any of my grandchildren, my nieces, my nephews, my children, never. The problem with this statement, of course, is that the family's core values are never defined. And even worse, those values have no frame or foundation beyond the closed loop of privatized self-referentiality. In the mother's voice, we find an implicit definition of community that centers on the private and the intimate, a definition according to which the other represents a threat to one's own clan. In contrast to her mother's obstinate self-referential discourse, and I should note as well that there's also an evolution in the mother's perspective, which comes uh, across late in the film, but this part that I'm talking about is earlier in the film. Um, so in contrast to the self-referential discourse of the mother, Lisette's loss of innocence culminates in an opening up of the self toward the public dimension uh, of ethics in an embracing of the self's responsibility toward the collective. Several factors in the film aid Lisette in this transformation. First, the realization that her aunt is lying to her and manipulating her. Second, her experiences visiting a pro Pinochet rally, as well as the Memory Museum, the Museum of Memory and Human Rights, which are starkly contrasting experiences that attune her to the fascist elements within Chilean society, as well as to the victim's pain. And finally, her own interaction with memory professionals lawyers, journalists, again, the figure of Rebolledo appears, victims, and even a psychiatrist. All the while, both visually on screen and verbally, Adriana Rivas tries to impose her will on her niece. We see a lot of uh, interesting uh, shots in which the, the figure of the aunt is very large on the screen and imposing with respect to the physical size uh, of her niece. And we see Lisette struggling to the very end to emerge intact as an ethical subject from the sometimes literal shadow of this powerful manipulative and authoritarian figure. A final and very tense interaction over Skype brings the ultimate rupture in the relationship, even as Lisette deflated accedes to her aunt verbally, unable to express rejection directly to her aunt's face. Her aunt, and it gets to be a very heated conversation and her aunt says to her, do you think I am a cynic? And Lisette, replies, no, it's very, very deflated. Yet in a final voiceover, she goes on to reflect, quote, I go over this scene one more time. It's important to the film. I realize how she manipulates me, interrogates me, humiliates me. I feel as if she's eaten me alive. It's so hard to talk to about her now. A year has passed and we haven't communicated. I am not the same anymore. I reconstructed her image in this narrative and our bond was severed. Out of pain, I pieced together the shards of my memory. The link can't be broken, but it can be transformed. And today I mourn the loss. The link can't be broken, but it can be transformed. Here we find a profound insight regarding the implicated subject. To be sure, the implicated subject cannot change his or her biological inheritance. The familial linkage will always remain. Nevertheless, he or she can seek ways to transform that inheritance and to transform the self to live ethically and responsibly in the service of the greater community. So I'll move to just a, a closing thought. The 2017 premiere of both of these films that I've examined coincided roughly with the presidential election that brought the former president, uh, Sebastián Piñera, a right-wing president and one of Latin America's richest men to the presidency for a second time. In August of that same year, 2017, José Antonio Cast, a then independent presidential candidate who had been a congressman and fervent militant in the far-right UDI party, Democratic Independent Union, which was the party closest to Pinochet's legacy, declared passionately at a rally at Santiago's Caupolicán Theater that he, quote, proudly defended the works of the military government. The fact that Cast obtained 10% of the vote in 2017 
in the first round showed that a measurable percentage of, Chile, of the Chilean population still openly identified with Pinochetismo, while another significant percentage identified with a more moderate right that still fervently upheld the neoliberal legacy of the dictatorship, even while admitting that human rights violations had occurred. I should note uh, that cast the same candidate, Cass, made it uh, to the second round in the most recent 2021 presidential election where he managed to come up with 44% of the vote. In 2017, however, the presence on the scene of hardline Pinochetismo coexisted with a moderate right that tamed the typical salvationist discourse, as well as a center left and left opposition that vociferously decried neoliberal policies, political corruption, gender inequality, the poor state of education, the conservatism of the Chilean state with respect to gender and sexual rights, the lack of recognition of indigenous peoples, and the lack of justice for crimes committed by the military civilian dictatorship. The Color of the Chameleon and Adriana's Pact, both courageous films, point to different ways in which implicated subjects face the inheritance of shameful, painful, and ethically vexing pasts. If Lubert's film is effectively an emotional drama in which a privatized language of forgiveness provides the balm that can begin to heal a fractured father-son relationship, Orozco's psychological thriller turns outward and seemingly acknowledges, as Daniela Jara powerfully suggests, that the language of forgiveness is not the only language through which dark family secrets can or should be addressed. Implicated subjects don't have to remain so forever. They can rebel against systems of oppression and against those who deny or downplay responsibility in wrongdoing. In the case of these two films, and especially in the case of Adriana's Pact, one might say that in a way they anticipate already in 2017, the great rebellion of Chilean society that was to culminate just two years later and whose effects are palpable in the country today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for this excellent presentation, which leaves us actually 20 good minutes. I mean, to, to, for the question and day. Yes, I see many uh, digital applause, I mean, that are much deserved. So actually, contrary to what I said before, I mean, I think it can actually be nice if people uh, would like to raise their hands and come on screen to ask questions, because at the end, we are 43, which we are a quite good group for an online seminar, but not not too many, not too many. So this is manageable. So uh, I I I encourage, of course, anyone who like to ask a question to to raise the hands and uh, and and ask something as as a chair. I mean, I will just break the ice with a first question. I mean, which um, in in a way concerns the 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 idea I mean, of ethical responsibility of the descendants of perpetrators, so people that we can easily frame uh, as uh, um, subjects with a kind of diachronic implications, I mean, that refers so, to, to the past. And I'm, 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 ju I'm just kind of thinking, I mean, so do, do you think that these, these groups, uh, somehow they, they, they have uh, uh, more responsibilities uh, than other people uh, of other groups. So we, we should uh, indeed expect from them uh, uh, something more in the way in which uh, they think about the past, in the way to which they speak about it, they try to represent it through culture or, or, or not, in a, in, a, in a way, first of all. And, 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 and then, I mean, if instead their, their, their actions can, uh, and, and their way of engaging with the past can also have a, a kind of transformative and positive effect uh, at a larger level, so beyond what is their personal entanglement with the family history. So I, I don't know if this makes sense, but if you could re reflect a bit on, on, on this link. Right, no, I think, I think that's a great question. So I'm hesitant to say that anyone has a greater or lesser. Uh, I, you know, I, I think, it, you know, I, I don't want to quantify in, the, in that way. Um, however, I think if you were to ask uh, members of the of the Disobedient Stories Collective, of you know this collective that I mentioned in the beginning, to which uh, at least um, Lisette Orozco is a member uh, of, of the Chilean. So there's a lot of allyship uh, between between these groups. I mean, I, I think that 
any of the people who have spoken out uh, publicly would, would say that they do have uh, a responsibility and that they embrace that responsibility. And perhaps they might even go so far as to say it's a, it's a, it's a greater responsibility. But I think these groups are really important because they make visible a kind of rupture with pacts of silence that um, had really existed for a long time. In the, in the Chilean case, for example, it became very commonplace for uh, you know, human rights groups to decry the pacts of silence within the La Familia Militar, the, the military family, which then at a certain point in, kind of, in common vernacular came to be known as La Familia Civico Militar, the, the civilian military uh, alliance. Um, but I, I do think that these groups are having a transformative effect, but I, did, I, wa I wanna say something very important, I think, which is that they don't, these groups don't emerge uh, surreptitiously out, out of nowhere. Um, they, are, they are groups that um, were, were providing spaces for dialogue, relationships of solidarity with one another in private spaces for quite some time. Um, they uh, provided strength uh, to one another. Um, in time, they met others who had similar experiences in other countries and found these allyships, but there was also kind of a, a greater geopolitical and sociopolitical moment and scene that allowed for these groups to emerge. And in Argentina, for example, there was a debate right around uh, the time of the emergence publicly of historias desobedientes when there was consideration for a reduction of the sentences of military perpetrators who were in prison. Uh, so they called this uh, the two for one, dos por uno, uh, it was called, where basically less the, you know, the sentences it was proposed were going to be cut in half for time served or good behavior, that, you know, those kinds of things. And these children said in this very, very publicly in this moment, no, the, this is not right. We step forward. Our parents committed these crimes against humanity. They should remain in prison. Their sentences should not be re, uh, reduced. So there was there was kind of a detonating uh, geo, geo uh, or sociopolitical moment that that allowed for the emergence, I think, in a very public way onto the scene. And there are also you know just individual circumstantial things within the lives of individual people. For example, you know it, it's. It, it in a way is circumstantial that we said Orozco was a filmmaker. She studied film. She went to uh, film school. So did uh, Andres Lubert, who is a, a bit of a different case and not part of this group that I'm mentioning, but he also uh, you know, studied film. So I think everybody's using the tools that they have at hand to tell the stories in different ways. And filmmaking has been a part of that, but there's also been uh, some important books that have been published as well. And all these things, I, I guess, from the transformative side, spark public uh, conversation and public debate, which I think uh, can play a, a very important role. Yes, absolutely it makes makes sense. Yes, and um, any any other questions from here? Yes, I have, a, I have a question. I'm trying to do this off my phone because my work computer is not playing ball with Zoom. So please bear with me. Um, thank you for that really fascinating paper and what a wonderful way to open this series of events. So thank you to everyone um, involved in that. I'm really coming at this from a Holocaust studies perspective. And I think in, in relation to Holocaust studies, this idea of second generation perpetrators has already started uh, to move. There has been a few uh, critics working in this area, looking at different films and different uh, literary accounts as well. And one of the things that's emerging in Holocaust studies, and I suppose my question is really whether this is also relevant in the Latin American context, is that there are two connected problems. The first of which is um, related to this question of victimhood, that in some way by having these generational accounts, the real victims of these oppressive regimes are somehow displaced. Uh, and actually these children in some cases and not in all, end up positing themselves as victims of their parents or as somehow having suffered uh, in relation to their parents' actions. So 
this is something that Erin McLaughlin talks about in relation to the Holocaust. And she she argues, and I've got the quote here, so excuse me while I read it. She argues that basically what's happening here is that it reduces it to a mundane trans-historical struggle between the generations. So in some way, the, the whole history and the politics is, is being displaced by this um, family narrative. So I just wonder whether you can speak to that, whether there is some sense here of an emerging victimhood and whether there is within all of this um, a displacement happening as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really excellent question. Um, and I think that what you're signaling is a risk that always exists um, in these in these particular cases. I actually think that um, just my, my, my personal from what I've read and, and what, I, what I've seen, I haven't seen that emerging as much as a problem in, in these particular cases, um, because I think that these groups are generally very reflective and they're generally quite careful um, about the way they position themselves. Um, they are not groups that appear on the scene hoping to sort of take the stage, the public stage in a way and displace other voices and other discourses. Rather, I see them standing more in allyship with a lot of uh, different, different movements uh, that are happening. Uh, there's a very close linkage, for example, between uh, Historias de Sobrevivientes, this group, and the feminist movement. Um, but also, you know, other other struggles, uh, whether they be for education or, uh, you know, gender and sexual rights and things, um, you know, for for those who have focused or looked at Chile in recent years, you know, there's there's been obviously major shifts and things happening there, um, you know, starting really. Yeah, I mean, there were there were social movements that were happening with different causes at the forefront over time, really, since about. 2006 in the history of the transition, but in uh, in October of 2019, uh, there was the great social uprising, what, what's called the Estallido Social, and I thought it was very interesting to see how Historias de Sobrevivientes participated in that moment, but just as one more group marching alongside and supporting other groups in a collective cause and collective action. So I think it's certainly not their intention to displace the victims, um, and I think they're careful about that. But uh, again, I, I think the question is very well posed and, and always represents a risk. Thank you. Sure. Yes, we, we have also a question in the chat. Uh, Maria Angeles would like to know if you, if you know other cultural representation that follow the same pattern of El Pacto de Adriana or El Color de Camaleon, but it, that actually refers to the Argentinian context. And then she's the thank you for the wonderful lecture. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Maria Angeles. I, I, um, I have not delved into this in the Argentine context uh, too much yet in terms of film. Uh, so that's part of the research to come. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, the more what I've seen are, um, are, are, are written books. There are a couple of compendiums, uh, actually, um, you know, kind of going back to the to the previous question, there's a, a compendium that's called Los Hijos de los 70, uh, the, the Children of the 70s, um, which is a book that brings together these voices of children who have had different experiences, militants and also uh, perpetrators. And one of the critiques that was levied against that particular book, kind of going back to the previous question, is the, that the book by juxtaposing and kind of putting into implicit dialogue with one another, all of these very different um, stories of children, kind of in a sense equalizes them in the space of the book and maybe uh, runs the risk in the editorial space of creating you know, this idea of kind of a victimhood across Across, uh, across the children. So that was one that was very controversial, but then the groups uh, of, of Desobedientes have actually published uh, manifestos. The manifesto is kind of the liminal piece at the beginning of a book called Escritos Desobedientes or Disobedient Stories. Um, which was kind of a first editorial project. But now uh, certain individuals are publishing longer accounts of their own experiences. Alani uh, Analia Kalinek, uh, who was one of the founders of Historias de Sobrevivientes in Argentina, recently published a book called Llevaré su nombre, um, I will carry his name, or I, I, will, I will carry the name of the, of the father, uh, basically. So the, these are accounts, I think, that are emerging in Argentina, and there's been some critical work on it. Um, actually, our 
dear uh, and recently departed colleague Leonor Arfuch uh, did some early writing on the disobedientes as well. Um, and there's a, a great new article uh, that just came out in the journal Mistral by Philippa Page from Newcastle uh, University in which she analyzes the Argentine case uh, a little bit more carefully as well. Um, so those are some things in the Argentine case. I know that in Peru, which is the other case that I'm looking at, there are younger filmmakers who, who are starting to take on uh, this idea of being the child of, uh, of people who commuted, committed human rights violations as part of the Shining Path uh, Maoist uh, revolutionary organization, which is uh, it, you know, generally referred to as a terrorist organization uh, in Peru and, and by the Peruvian Truth Commission. So these other, uh, stories are emerging, but there are also in the space of books as well, um, such as uh, the one that Guido mentioned at the beginning that I, I did a translation of recently called uh, Los Rendidos or The Surrendered by Jose Carlos Aguero, in which he really grapples with this idea of being the son of Shining Path uh, militants. So I think we'll see it more and more. I actually heard, I haven't delved into it much, but I heard that there's a Paraguayan um, I don't know if it, it's if there are several people at this point, but there are at least a couple of hijos uh, of perpetrators that have come forward from pa Paraguay as well. So there may be kind of an emergent um, chapter of uh, historias de sobrevivientes in Paraguay as well. And I see there's some good other things in the chat, other um, other recommendations, and of course, Lior. Uh, Seidelman's uh, work as well is, is absolutely crucial on this subject. Yes, yes, there are several other comments uh, from experts of Southern America, and I cannot count myself among them, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to, to add, add anything on that. But I see, yes, someone who is uh, actually would like to ask a question this is David Martin Jones. Yes, please, David. Hello. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. That was a wonderful talk. Really fascinating. And I learned a great deal. Um, I haven't seen these documentaries. So my question is from uh, a place of being interested, but not knowing. And I was thinking you mentioned early on post memory work. And I just started thinking about the documentaries we might typically talk about there, like Los Rubios, for example, which is a very, at times, playful aesthetic using toys and so on which is also appears in uh, the use of toys to recreate the past in, in other works, um, like The Missing Picture, um, not from Latin America, obviously. And so my question is this, is the kind of memory work that goes on in these documentaries aesthetically uh, quite distinct from that kind of post-memory work, or um, is it just as we might expect of documentary aesthetics? I think uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, I mean, these are both really interesting uh, films. I, I would say that uh, The Color of the Chameleon uses some of the more traditional, I, I mean, I guess traditional is just a, a word, I guess, <laughs> traditional techniques uh, that we see in the filmmakers uh, of the children. Los Rubios, of course, was always kind of, in a way, the outlier and the pioneer um, in, the, in the South American uh, space, the use of the Playmobil, uh, figures as a way to kind of uh, vicariously represent past that she couldn't access. And, you know, I think it was a, it was very kind of innovative and, and forward, forward looking. Um, and, the, and the wigs, kind of the, perf the performative dimensions, the use of an actress to play uh, the role of herself and so forth. We, we don't see anything that goes to those extremes in these particular films, but um, uh, the Color of the Chameleon, you know, the, if you look at other films like uh, The Chilean Building by Macarena Aguiló or um, uh, Car uh, Herman Berger's uh, My Life with Carlos uh, about the disappearance of his father, you know, I, I think that The Color of the Chameleon from a formal standpoint is more in line with films like that. I think that uh, the Pact of Adriana uh, is, is interesting because of the use of mediation. Uh, in particular. I mean, all these films about post-memory have mediated qualities to them, of course, but the use of Skype, the use of, um, you know, her showing footage of her aunt and then kind of juxtaposing herself to it, um, you know, telephone conversations, you know, all these things add kind of plot intrigue and and led to the lend themselves to this feeling that you're actually watching kind of a detective story or a psychological thriller of some kind so there's definitely a, you know so even though you're watching a documentary it's 
there's work with with particular genres of storytelling uh, that that are happening in that film that I think give it a lot of aesthetic appeal. Thank you very much. Sure. So I, I think we have time for at least another question. And now I, I don't want to put him on the spotlight, but I have the impression that Stefano Bellin had raised the hand before. Yes. So indeed, it's back. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Guido. And thank you, Michael, for the wonderful presentation. Um, I know that you also worked on Jose Carlos Aguero, no? Uh, yes. So I wanted to ask you if you see any similarities in, in the way in which uh, Jose Carlos Aguero as a kind of complexly implicated subject deals with his position and in the way in which these two filmmakers deal with their own implicated position. If there are any, what are the commonalities, uh, the similarities and the differences and if there are something that is culture specific in, in Peru and in Chile. And the other question was uh, about the aesthetic medium. How do you kind of, how does the aesthetic medium that, uh, the aesthetic choices that these artists, filmmakers or writers, uh, how do their aesthetic choices influence the way in which they give an account of themselves and also of the parents or kind of the intergenerational questions they are dealing with? Thanks again for the wonderful presentation. That's a that's a fantastic question, and I'm going to be uh, one of us, Guido or uh, Diana. We have to copy the chat because I want to get all these great references that I don't know myself that <laughs> that people are putting there. So, um, the question about Jose Carlos Aguero is an interesting one. So I am I am not uh, you know pretty much all of my work to this point has dealt with Chile, and I would say to to a certain extent with Argentina. Um, Peru is kind of a recent addition uh, from a research standpoint, and that really is thanks to a, a dear colleague of mine uh, at, at UC Davis, where, where I teach, uh, Charles Walker, who's a Peruvianist uh, historian. And, and so I, I went with Chuck a couple of times uh, to Peru, and we interviewed uh, Jose Carlos Aguero as part of this project, so got to know him quite well. His, his book, Los Rendidos, for those who do not know it, has really made a very important intervention. Um, you know, there weren't too many voices of children of members of Shining Path that had been publicly on the scene. And so it was really a voice that brought a rupture and a different perspective within the memory, uh, collective memory or pu public memory uh, debates. In, and, and really, I mean, it did try to participate in a debate because it's quite a, a provocative uh, book in a lot of ways. Um, Jose Carlos Aguero, uh, wants to ask very difficult questions of himself and also of Peruvian society. So there's really, uh, you know, quite a, uh, a use from, you know, thinking about kind of aesthetics or rhetoric uh, of the rhetorical question uh, throughout that book. You know, he wonders about, he, he takes these terms that are part of the vernacular of post-conflict transitions and he interrogates them all. Um, forgiveness, reconciliation, um, human rights, you know, I, he's been a figure who has both been an ally of the human rights movements, but also um, critical uh, of, the, of the human rights movements in Peru as well. So, you know, the, he's, a, he's a figure that is, has, I think, been well received by some and really reviled um, by, by many others, depending on where they sit and what their perspective is. So that book actually, I think, is quite different from the two films in that it has a very deeply reflexive and self-reflexive flavor. Um, these other films uh, are working toward different ends. You know, I would say as uh, Jose Carlos Aguero leaves the question open and lingering without trying to resolve it, and he does to a certain extent also acknowledge his own complicity in all of this. I think that the other two are working more as I was kind of trying to explain in the paper toward reconcil reconciliation within the family unit in the case of um, in the case of the color of the chameleon and in the case of Adriana's pact, it's more of a, of a cutting ties and realizing that sometimes that's necessary um, in order to you know sort of do the, do the right thing. Um, but from an aesthetic standpoint, or in terms of the medium, I mean, I think the medium does determine to some degree, because it's not as if you can't have a very open-ended aesthetic 
within the space of a film as well, you certainly can. But I think in Jose Carlos's case, the book medium lends itself a little bit more to kind of that pondering, philosophical, reflexive nature. Whereas in the uh, in the films, you know, there's they're telling the stories in the ways that they can feel like they can tell them. I mean, it, you know, honestly, very interestingly, we said Orozco, when she started out, she only planned to make a film that was sort of a portrait of her aunt. She didn't plan to have herself be included in the film at all or to take up the, the, the genre of the first person documentary. And it was her film teachers who said, really, you know, this proposal that you've given to us and this film that you're planning to make is a film that's really about you. Uh, more than about your aunt. And so, you know, kind of following in, you know, what's been called the reflexive turn uh, within, within documentary filmmaking, you know, she really took up kind of that style uh, for the film. But I think that style suited her only after she had that discovery that the story that she was needing to tell or wanting to tell really lent itself better to that genre than to the way that she was originally planning to do it. So, so form definitely um, is not just reactive, but also determinant to a certain extent of the way the stories get told, I would say. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Michael. I, I think that with this, we'll have, we reach the end of the seminar because I also know that Michael uh, has another appointment later and, and needs to leave. So I saw indeed that there was another question in the chat, which was also a bit of uh, uh, a complex question, I mean, but I'm happy to say, I mean, that we we'll still have time to discuss uh, uh, issues, I mean, re related on uh, on implication and the past of dictatorship uh, with this next seminar session that will take place on the 27th of April, so it's when, Wednesday, 27th of April, still at 5 p.m. in Dublin, and uh, uh, the speaker is going to be Professor Juliane Pradeweiss, uh, who was here, I mean, but she... I don't know if she's still here, Giuliane, but she said that she she had a, a, a yes, I saw her, I saw her picture. She had an, a stable uh, connection, I mean, internet um, with her internet, so she could not uh, put the camera on. But so I hope that uh, you found the session useful, and I look forward to welcoming you to the next one on when, on Wednesday, twenty seventh of April. Thanks so much for uh, for attending this. And thank you so much, Michael, first of all. Yes, very appreciated. Thank you.